Good evening, everyone. My name is Jody Barkin from the University of Miami, where I'm an associate professor and associate director of our Pancreas Center. And today I'm really honored to be here on the behalf of CAPER for an amazing session regarding diagnosis of acute and chronic pancreatitis and early diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. As a few housekeeping reminders before we go ahead, if everyone could please mute their microphones during the presentation. Any questions that you have, if you can put them in the chat box, we'll collect them and be able to answer them in a QA and a at the end. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two speakers. Both of our speakers are wonderful and renowned clinicians in the field of pancreatology. They're both members of the NIH and IDDK consortium, the chronic pancreatitis, diabetes, and pancreatic cancer, the CPDPC. And our first speaker is Dr. Tamal Turks, who's an associate professor of radiology at the University of Indiana, where his focus is abdominal radiology and specifically MRI of the pancreas. And he'll be giving us a lecture on the radiologic approach to acute and chronic pancreatitis. Thereafter, Dr. Suresh Chari, who's professor in the Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, will be speaking to us about the early diagnosis of pancreatic cancer using clinical, laboratory, and imaging clues. And we know that near and dear to Dr. Chari's heart is an interest in early detection of pancreatic cancer, specifically using diabetes as a biomarker. We're excited for a wonderful educational session tonight and look forward to bringing this to you. Without further ado, Dr. Turks. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, my, as Dr. Barkin mentioned, I'm, my name is Tim Antwerkis. I'm a radiologist and interested in uh, imaging of the pancreatitis specifically, and recently about diabetes as well. So I will talk to you about the radiologic approach to diagnose of acute and chronic pancreatitis. I will show you uh, cases and uh, which will be in the form of um, show and tell. But what we see in the uh, abdominal imaging reading room uh, when we have a um, large amount of um, pancreatitis patients. This is my disclosures. And in terms of modality, let's uh, talk about the ultrasound first, which uh, is somewhat limited in the uh, certain population, especially the large patients. And the ultrasound has the least uh, benefit of uh, penetrating to large size patients. And oftentimes it is uh, difficult to assess pancreas, uh, which is a retroperitoneal organ. And it is difficult to uh, visualize from anterior approach and posteriorly it is uh, hidden behind the, the vertebral body. So oftentimes we do not have much chance or uh, luck um, in getting any detail from the pancreas. Uh, sometimes if patient is really um, thin, uh, low BMI, young patients or pediatric population, ultrasound can be performed, but oftentimes, especially in the Midwest population like we have, ultrasound is very limited. In acute pancreatitis, uh, we'll talk about the CT primarily. I think the CT is the primary imaging modality for acute pancreatitis, but MRI and MRCP has a role as well. And uh, you probably know about this, the revised Atlantic classification. We use this in interpretation of the radiologic images as well. It separates the, the fluid collections before and after four weeks, and also whether the pancreatitis is interstitial or necrotic. And the imaging studies, the contrast enhanced imaging studies are the, the main uh, modality to tell whether the patient has interstitial or acute pancreatitis. For example, this is a contrast enhanced CT of the pancreas. And this is uh, the, not the normal looking pancreas. There is some edema and fatty strandiness around it. And the contrast is homogeneously enhancing the pancreas and therefore no necrosis is suspected. We call this interstitial pancreatitis. Uh, after a couple of days or maybe a week, some fluid collections may form. And we look at the pancreas, it is homogeneous and enhancing without any uh, perfusion defects. And therefore we call this interstitial pancreatitis and the fluid collection will be a peripancreatic, acute peripancreatic fluid collection, which is seen, it is still free, not blanculated or walled off. 
And more complicated cases, we may see air uh, bubbles within this uh, collection, which is walled off. And uh, in fact, uh, when you see an air bubble, you always suspect if there is an uh, infection uh, within the collection as well. And in fact, the, the drainage tube was placed and the pure load material was obtained. And therefore, they decided to bury an to this patient, which is seen here. And there was a leak of the uh, barium or gastrographin into the collection there. So there was a fistula from the fluid collection into the descending colon, as you can see here. This is a little bit later after four weeks, and uh, we see a thick walled off fluid collection, which is pretty sizable. Somehow this was not drained, and it is compressing the pancreas, stomach, and other organs as well. It has a thick capsule. And so this could be um, either Waldorf necrosis or pseudocyst. And if you do an MRI, you see better internal architecture of the cyst as well as the capsule. And uh, the capsule is um, and progressively enhancing. This is an early arterial phase. This is a venous phase image. And the thick enhancing capsule is visualized which indicates that this is a mature fluid collection with a fibrotic wall. Uh, another complication that happens in the acute pancreatitis is of course a vascular uh, type. And in this case, there is a focal dilatation of the splenic artery next to the uh, necrotic collection. And this is a pseudoaneurysm. It is easy to miss. It may only be shown in one slice so we really have to do arterial and venous phase uh, of pancreatic imaging to catch these small uh, pseudoaneurysms. So pancreas protocol with CT and MRI is always multiphasic to look at the arterial anatomy and also the venous uh, complications. This is a more extensive case of acute pancreatitis. And uh, the image on the left, um, is a little bit earlier stage. An image on the right is about three weeks later. As you can see, this is a, a necrotic uh, collection. There is significant fat necrosis, also pancreatic necrosis, and it results in these chronic uh, fluid collection within the lesser sac. After a couple of weeks, you see more organization of the collection and formation of a wall as well. And uh, once again, the, the air is always worse in finding in the absence of a drainage tube. And it should be suspected that there might be a fistula to a uh, bowel or uh, some sort of super infection uh, may have formed. And these collections are usually drained uh, to decrease the amount of um, you know, the healing process. Sometimes we also do MRI in selective cases in a case of acute pancreatitis. Uh, for example, this is a loculated fluid collection in the region of uh, splenic hilum near the pancreatic tail. And on a follow-up CT scan, this collection has increased in size significantly. And uh, it wasn't sure, based on looking at this image, there was a hemorrhage within this collection or not. Is this really a blood or is it really a, uh, the, you know, the thick uh, debris within the collection? But when you do an MRI, this is a T1 rated image. The MRI uh, shows that there is increased T1 signal, which is a feature of acute hemorrhage. And after giving contrast, we do not see any enhancement within this tissue. Classic hemorrhagic collection uh, can be diagnosed with much more uh, certainty. There is also benefit of the, uh, doing MRCP in ductal complications such as ductal leak or uh, disruption. This is a case of ductal leak. This is a pancreatic duct. This large fluid collection is a vault of necrosis, patient had necrotizing pancreatitis. And there was a fluid collection in the vicinity of the pancreatic, uh, main pancreatic duct. And this is before secretin image and this is after secretin image. Secretin enhanced the, this tiny little uh, remaining pancreatic duct, and we were able to show the communication with the fluid collection. So it 
uh, sometimes it is helpful to say that there is ductal complications using MRI as well. This is the same case with ERCP confirmation. Here's another ductal leak shown by MRCP. Uh, there is a fluid collection here, which is very close to the main pancreatic duct. And this was uh, shown that there is a little communication between the main, main pancreatic duct and the fluid collection. This is the larger uh, field of view uh, of the fluid collection, and which is uh, in close proximity with the main pancreatic duct. So whenever we see a fluid collection close to the main pancreatic duct, we should always look into possibility of ductal leak or disruption. Another uh, benefit of doing MRI in case of acute pancreatitis uh, is to see the internal content of the cyst. Is it hemorrhagic like I have shown before, or is it non-hemorrhagic? This is a T2-weighted image with uh, significant debris seen within the blood collection, which is not really clearly visualized by uh, CT, which uses uh, density to make images. Uh, another case of MRI helping you or giving you more information about what is going on here in the pancreatic bed. There is heterogeneous um, enhancement. Is this uh, a hemorrhagic collection or is this a residual pancreatic tissue? And when you do an MRI and give contrast, this is the pre-contrast image. And these are the post-contrast images on the right side. And it shows that there is enhancing tissue uh, within this collection, meaning that it is not a blood or hem hematoma, it is actually a uh, viable pancreatic tissue. So it's a, in, a good information to give to surgeon if he or she is planning to do a surgery. So that's about the chronic pancreatitis in our limited time. So I'm gonna switch to chronic pancreatitis. And typically chronic pancreatitis is diagnosed with uh, ductal imaging and MRI and MRCP is superior to uh, the uh, CT in terms of ductal anatomy, but internal inter-observer variability is not optimal. And MRI composes of basically uh, T1 and TT weighted images. And MRCP is also TT weighted image with suppression of the T2 signal from all the soft tissues and organs and just letting us see the ductal anatomy only. On the left is a mild chronic pancreatitis or Cambridge II patient with minor uh, ductal ectasia. And we can see the same thing on the same patient using the MRCP as well. The benefit of the MRCP, it is a non-invasive procedure. And this is a Cambridge IV severe chronic pancreatitis case and very irregular pancreatic duct with filling defects we see the irregularity and filling defects with MRCP. And uh, other thing that we can evaluate with the MRCP is we can uh, look into the ductal anatomy uh, in uh, really good and exquisite details. This is a case of pancreas divisum, complete divisum. In the middle, image shows an, an interesting anatomy with, which can be described as an incomplete divisum. The one on the right is showing the pancreatic duct with a loop configuration and come the dilated common bile duct as well. And this is a, uh, we, we also give a secretin many of our patients at IU and a secretin dilates the main pancreatic duct and enhances the uh, image of the main pancreatic duct. Sometimes we see the ectatic side branches better with, uh, after giving secretin. And uh, like I said, the benefits are enhancing the ductal anatomy, but it also gives you, lets you observe the excretion of the pancreatic juice from the main pancreatic duct into the duodenum. This is a pre-secretin image, main pancreatic duct, Three minutes after the secretin, you see a better visualization of the main pancreatic duct and excretion of the fluid into the duodenal lumen. So we published indications of secretin in 2013 in this journal. If there is 
calcified or calcific chronic pancreatitis, uh, you won't be able to see the calcification with MRI or MRCP. That's basically the main limitation of the MRI. So CT is definitely has a place in imaging of the chronic pancreatitis. And uh, after the diagnosis with MRI and MRCP, oftentimes the follow-ups are performed with CT. I'd like to talk about some new imaging techniques for chronic pancreatitis as well. And a chronic pancreatitis is the pathology shows a ductal dilatation and distortion, parenchymal fibrosis, and loss of acinar cells and islet cells. And we only detect the Cambridge uh, ductal dilatation and distortion using the Cambridge classification, whereas we do not have a criteria for changes in the extracellular matrix or exocrine cells, which is composed, composes 80% of the pancreatic parenchyma. So with the Cambridge classification, we only visualize 5% uh, of the pancreatic parenchyma or changes secondary to chronic pancreatitis. For this reason, new MR imaging techniques for chronic pancreatitis has been uh, developed and these have been uh, published in the literature. Basically, T1 imaging of the pancreas is the most promising technique so far. And it basically detects the proteinaceous material uh, within the parenchyma. The more the proteinaceous material, the brighter the T1 image is. As it can be seen here, this is a pancreatic parenchyma, which is normal. This is spleen and liver. It is the brightest organ on pre-contrast T1 image if everything is normal with the pancreas. So we published the T1 signal intensity ratio as an imaging biomarker for the staging of chronic pancreatitis very recently. In this paper, we show that uh, on the left is a normal uh, uh, pancreas with no evidence of chronic pancreatitis. Signal intensity ratio to the spleen here is 1.3, whereas in a severe chronic pancreatitis patient, signal intensity ratio significantly decreases to 1.07. We also propose the mechanistic staging of chronic pancreatitis from zero to six, and then its signal intensity ratio was progressively declining in this, um, based on the severity of the chronic pancreatitis. In another paper, we showed that the C1 signal intensity ratio correlates with the bicarbonate level within the pancreatic juice as well. So it also gives information about the exocrine dysfunction. There's also quantitative MRI of chronic pancreatitis these are mainly T1 mapping, ECV, fat fraction, and diffusion weighted images. T1 relaxation time is measured within the, with the T1 mapping as opposed to the signal intensity ratio. This gives a quantitative value of the T, uh, any parenchyma, uh, including the pancreas. Here's what the T1 mapping looks like. The, the baseline images were T2 weighted images but the T1 mapping shows more uh, detail or information about the tissue. The one on the left is a Cambridge zero, no chronic pancreatitis patient. The one on the right is a Cambridge four, severe chronic pancreatitis patient showing abnormal T1 relaxation times within the tissue. So again, uh, T1 normal and mild uh, severe chronic pancreatitis patient. And ECV fraction is uh, measuring the extracellular volume fraction Again, it, it is helping uh, and showing us that the extracellular tissue uh, increases uh, within, with the chronic pancreatitis. MRE of the pancreas is still under development for the pancreas. And in MRE, we also use sound beams, which are sometimes difficult to penetrate if the patient is not a normal size or low BMI, but has a body like this, if it is large, and it becomes very difficult, but we are able to obtain the signal back from the pancreas in some patients. But as you can see, it is sometimes challenging, especially in severe chronic pancreatitis patients with uh, atrophic pancreas. All right, so I think I finished in 22 minutes. So time for questions. Thank you, sir. I think if it's okay with everybody, we will move on to Dr. Chari's lecture and then have a group discussion with questions at the end. Remember to our amazing audience, please put your questions in the chat box and you can put those in during the lecture and we'll, we'll collate them together for um, 
our discussion at the end. Without further ado, Dr. Chari will be presenting to us again on early detection of pancreatic cancer. Thanks, Jody. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All good. Good, good. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak on this subject. I have had a pretty much lifelong interest in early detection of pancreatic cancer um, using diabetes as a marker. And unfortunately, most of what I'm going to say will fall in the research realm, though the data is nearly all uh, human data. So, uh, just want to start by acknowledging uh, Ayush Sharma, a research fellow who uh, did uh, most of the work I'm going to be presenting today that included uh, three papers in gastroenterology span of 18 months or so, uh, a remarkable effort. Um, so let me start by discussing the normal progression of pancreatic cancer. Like everything else, uh, it starts as carcinoma in situ, which is not uh, visible. Um, at about 10 millimeters, uh, or what some Japanese would call minute pancreatic cancer, it becomes invasive. And by 20 millimeters, uh, it has about 40% will have uh, neighboring METs. And this has been called small pancreatic cancer. The average size of a resectable lesion is actually 30 millimeters, and vast majority of them are unresectable. But uh, the biggest problem is by the time symptoms occur, 85% uh, are uh, unresectable with 50% of them having stage four disease. So we have been interested in the pre-diagnostic phase of pancreatic cancer and trying to understand any clues that might be there. And so we think, so you'll be seeing data that's presented um, all the way back to 60 months before diagnosis, trying to see if there's anything out there that would suggest the presence of underlying pancreatic cancer. And the symptoms last usually three months, but can go up to six months before. So here is the, the duration of symptoms in pancreatic cancer. And you'll see that the majority of the symptoms are occurring within six months. And before that, it's, it's really uncommon to have symptoms, or at least they're very nonspecific. Even in the six month period, it's the last few weeks um, that the symptoms become more severe. And in, obviously in the last couple of weeks, John just directly points to pancreas as the possible origin of, this, of the symptoms. So what we have done is studied uh, various factors that might be give us a clue that includes blood sugar, which was our original interest, uh, and then lipids, weight, body temperature, uh, changes in uh, soft tissue, both fat and muscle. Um, and for the, uh, the blood sugar lipids weight studies, we we had a population-based control, uh, the PDAC cases, about 219 cases and 657 controls. Um, and for the, uh, and so this is a temporal metabolic profile of these uh, various parameters. The soft tissue studies were done using clinic-based um, pancreatic cancer patients. Again, both uh, these are temporal profiles over time. So most of the slides will be in this format. So I'll take a little bit of time to explain this. So on your right side is at diagnosis and way on the left side is minus 60 months, which is five years from diagnosis. The red line is controls and the cases uh, are in blue, blue dotted line. This particular graph uh, looks at fasting glucose over time, and the time intervals are six monthly here. Uh, and so the cases in control, the blood sugar is abstracted from the charts and plotted uh, over time. And it shows that at between 30 and 36 months, the glucose level in pancreatic cancer is significantly higher than in controls. 
by about 12 months or so, it crosses the diabetes threshold. Um, and so that's about the lead time for diabetes and pancreatic cancer. This plots the weight of these patients over the same time frame. And uh, interestingly, you will note that the weight starts dropping around 18 months before uh, diagnosis at a time when the patient has no symptoms. So the symptoms uh, are in red and uh, in the red box. And, and, and this, these, this uh, change in, in weight is happening um, well before that. So I call this a PCDM paradox because in diabetes, you should be losing weight uh, or gaining weight. And, and here, paradoxically, even as you're losing weight, the glucose is going up, something which is, I think, fundamental for the pathogenesis of diabetes and pancreatic cancer. And we have some clues uh, to what, what's going on here. Um, but the other question we asked was, if weight decreases and glucose increases, uh, which way does the lipids go? Normally, the weight decrease in weight should cause the lipids to go down, and the glucose increase should cause the lipids to go up. And here, both are happening. So we had to look to find out what's going on with that. So here is the total cholesterol plotted in the same population. And you'll see that it's starting to drop 18 months before diagnosis. So it seems to go. Uh, with the weight uh, and the total cholesterol. The triglycerides do the same. They start dropping around 18 months before diagnosis. And LDL does the same. So all three of them are parallelly going down about 18, starting about 18 months before diagnosis. The HDL, interestingly, does not drop till uh, the last few months before diagnosis, and it's not different earlier than that. So this is a summary of the profiles uh, that I've discussed so far. Um, the FBG starts rising at minus 30 to 36 months. The lipids, uh, at least the triglycerides, the total cholesterol, um, they start, and LDL start going down around 18 months the HDL drops um, and the symptoms start. So what happens to soft tissue changes in this, in this phase? So we have basically um, used those CT scans prior to diagnosis um, and calculated the uh, adipose, visceral adipose tissue, uh, subcutaneous adipose tissue and muscle mass before diagnosis. So, um, so the changes in subcutaneous and visceral adiposition muscle uh, in pre-diagnostic PDAC. So here is subcutaneous adipose tissue, and it seems to follow the pattern of the of lip triglycerides and total cholesterol. It starts to drop um, 18 months before diagnosis. This coincides with the pay with the weight. Uh, graph I showed you where the weight loss starts happening 18 months before. So it appears to be an adipose tissue loss that uh, coincides with the uh, drop in weight. Um, and that adipose tissue is uh, of the visceral, uh, of the subcutaneous compartment. When you look at the visceral compartment, it's, it's starting to drop only uh, in the last six months before diagnosis. It seems to be stable until then and it drops at the end. So it has something to do with cachexia just as the HDL does. And the muscle also follows the visceral adipose tissue. So as you may recall, there are symptoms associated with cachexia that occur closer to diagnosis. That includes fatigue, um, decreased exercise tolerance. Um, and those are symptoms that are associated with muscle loss and here we can see some visceral position loss. Whereas before this, if you ask the patients, they will say that they, they won't even complain about the weight loss because they're actually happy about the weight loss that's happening 18 months before. And whenever I've interviewed patients, they have always told me that they took credit for that weight loss because it, it seems like they had manipulated their diet and lost weight. But the data suggests that there is something else going on here. Um, so 
what is the connection between drop in weights, the change in lipids, and subcutaneous adipose tissue? The findings of, uh, you'll see that browning of subcutaneous adipose tissue. So brown fat is normally um, found in neonates and, and is, is a um, fat that uh, in a metabolically has mitochondrial, uh, uncouples uh, mitochondrial respiration from ATP synthesis and generates heat. Um, and the signature marker protein is uncoupling protein one. And it's seen in response to cold exposure uh, because it generates heat. And obviously neonates have a lot of it because they, they are basically born without significant amount of uh, ability to fight uh, cold, so they have that. But in adults, there's browning a white fat called bright fat or uh, beige fat, and, and it is uh, associated with non-shivering thermogenesis. Um, and it is associated with increased expression of genes for uncoupling. So the uh, adipose tissue loss and browning of, of subcutaneous adipose tissue is well described in, in cancer. So we hypothesize that PDAC caused browning of, of subcutaneous adipose tissue. And if true, this would raise body temperature because ultimately browning is, is, uh, uh, leads to uh, generation of heat. So we, to confirm our hypothesis, we did a number of different studies. We did animal studies where we looked at subcutaneous adipose tissue of genetically engineered mouse models of PDAC. We did experimental studies where we exposed uh, PDAC uh, exosomes to human subcutaneous adipose tissue. We also did uh, uncoupling protein one gene expression in the human biopsy, the subcutaneous biopsies. And of course, we looked at the temporal profile of body temperature uh, in these patients. So this is an animal study showing that there is increased expression of UCP1 in the subcutaneous fat of uh, animals uh, that are bearing pancreatic cancer. Um, when we took uh, uh, human adipose tissue from normal adults and exposed them to exosomes from pancreatic cancer, there was a dramatic increase in the expression of different uh, of uh, brown adipose tissue genes and something that we had seen before but didn't know what to do with that information until we got the rest of the information which put the whole story together and then we looked at subcutaneous fat biopsies we found a marked increase in expression of ucp1 which um, seemed to suggest that our uh, hypothesis was uh, likely true but the most interesting thing was we plotted the temperature on these patients and sure enough, the temperature rose about the same time as the subcutaneous adipose tissue was being lost. And uh, you can see the red is controls and the blue is, is uh, purple is, is cases. And when we took the non-weight losing patients, this effect was gone. So it was only seen in patients who were losing weight. So this is a summary of all the, all the evidence we have generated so far. And we, we call this phases of, of, of pancreatic cancer uh, metabolic changes. And there's a phase zero where there's metabolic silence in the sense there's nothing happening metabolically. And that's before uh, 30 to 36 months. And then there is a phase when glucose is rising, but we don't see any other metabolic change. Uh, I'm not sure what the explanation for this is. And then there is this phase when there is both a rise in glucose and drop in lipids and drop in subcutaneous adipose tissue, which we think is because of browning of white fat. And then there is a phase of cachexia where there's muscle loss, uh, visceral adipose tissue loss, um, and of course, continuing to rise in blood sugar of these patients. And we believe that uh, the uh, subcutaneous adipose tissue might hold some additional uh, biomarkers that could help understand if a person with diabetes who's losing weight uh, is it due to pancreatic cancer or due to just his own, uh, his or her own efforts at losing weight. So in summary, these findings clearly demonstrate three distinct and progressive metabolic changes uh, in the pre-diagnostic phase of pancreatic cancer, starting about two and a half years before diagnosis. 
and weight loss in phase two, which starts around one and a half years before diagnosis and precedes the development of muscle loss is likely due to browning of, of subcutaneous adipose tissue. And UCP1 overexpression in, the, in biopsies of the subcutaneous tissue may be a biomarker of pancreatic cancer in weight losing subjects with new onset hyperglycemia. Now I'll stop here and take questions. And I'll tell you that while our studies have been uh, on, on sporadic pancreatic cancer, the more and more I see data on familiar pancreatic cancer, I see that almost the same thing applies there. So um, interesting, will be interesting to see how that plays out, but I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you, Tamela and Suresh, for two wonderful, wonderful lectures, really enlightening. And we always learn from these types of really innovative, cutting edge lectures where we've seen the newest, best data and what the future holds for the care of our patients. In piggybacking on to Suresh's talk just now, um, you have mentioned a series of metabolic and soft tissue changes that we see early and group them into these very interesting phases. The question would be, what are your thoughts on potentially applying these in higher risk populations? For example, patients with strong family history of pancreatic cancer that may or may not have a genetic component? And if so, how might those perform? So I, I think that uh, it's already getting done in the sense that the, um, you know, I call it metabolic surveillance of, of familial uh, pancreatic cancer kindred. So if you measure glucose and you monitor their weight, you're potentially doing part of what, what uh, we think is, is the most important ingredients of this. The lipids are hard to, to follow because if patients are on medications, then how do you see if it's medication induced or not? But uh, through this weight loss and, and rising glucose is part of the NPAC score. So technically you can, you can calculate the NPAC score of these patients. So all of this is very valid in the familial setting and, and is being applied by some other people. There are some papers coming out on that. And we are ourselves doing studies on new onset diabetes that are applying the NPAC score to those patients and identifying an even higher risk group that can be screened with CTs. So. It's starting to get translated, but the last mile is the hardest, mile, longest mile, so. Most definitely. And I guess with that, is this something that we should think about looking into, for example, early screening in the lipid clinics in patients that don't have a known family history? Thoughts on there, or is that too wide of a net? Yeah, I think if you start from lipids, you'll end up with a lot of people who are uh, on medications and it's very hard. I don't know, I don't know how to start from lipids as a starting point. Uh, weight loss is, and diabetes is, 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 is okay, but I don't, I, yeah, it needs further study to see if we can start with the lipids as a starting point, yeah. Sure. There may be sure. other features of this weight loss that I don't know enough, and the change in lipids, there may be other biomarkers associated with it that would probably be more helpful, yeah. Great, thank you. Tamil, you mentioned and, and shown some really amazing images with the value of secretin. Unfortunately, for some people across the country that may not be available at every institution, and just wanted to get your thoughts on the value of MRCPs to look at ductal leaks in general, um, if secretin is not available, and how might you go about that to enhance if you don't have secretin? Uh, I think the, uh, if you do not have secretin, then the, the best thing to do is to train the MR technologists to produce a really good high quality pre and MR uh, images as well. So it can still be done, but it is going to be, uh, you're gonna have less chance of seeing the leak uh, without giving secretin. And what secretin does is, is secretes the fluid into the fluid collection directly. So you actually have a better chance of seeing the leak if you utilize secretin. So, excellent, thank you. An additional question, you know, you, in terms of following acute bleeds into peripancreatic collections, we've obviously seen the benefit of contrast enhancement, but one of the things that's oftentimes difficult is to differentiate prior hemorrhagic contents from necrotic contents in and of themselves and any tips or tricks that you've found along the way not for the acute bleed, but for the one that you're trying to figure out the collection, let's say a couple of weeks or even a couple of months later. 
Uh, I think MRI is the modality of choice if you're looking for uh, acute hemorrhage or if there is a, a chronic hemorrhage within the collection. Uh, all the, you know, the, the blood products, uh, hemoglobin is uh, causes significant changes in the uh, signal intensity on the MRI. So it is very sensitive to detect that. And second, in acute uh, hemorrhagic cases, uh, the MRI has uh, imaging uh, modality called subtraction. Uh, we can actually see the contrast um, enhancement without uh, the, the, the signal from the hemorrhage itself. So it is really a great tool to show acute hemorrhage as well as a chronic hemorrhage. And CT is far inferior compared to the MRI in terms of when there's a hemorrhagic complications. Excellent, thank you. As a reminder to the audience, if you have any questions before we wrap up, please put them in the chat box and we'll get them answered as soon as possible. And one additional question, Tamel, you know, the work that you just presented um, on your T1 signal intensity is really interesting and obviously very cutting edge in just the last couple of weeks. Can you expand to the, as an audience, we can understand a little bit better in terms of the gold standard and if there's a thought on how this might correlate, for example, with Rosemont criteria on endoscopic ultrasound? Or is this an area for future research for investigators in the audience? I think this yeah, used to be a, 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 the research, but it is it should get into the clinical practice. And we have been working on the T1 signal or the, any parenchymal features of the MRI in chronic pancreatitis for almost a decade now. Uh, we started with diffusion-weighted imaging and then switched to T1 signal intensity ratio. After that, T1 uh, mapping and finally extracellular volume fraction. MRI has a lot of tools which are cutting edge tools to visualize the parenchymal changes. In Rosemont criteria, um, there, there is a parenchymal criteria, but in MRI, we still do not have a parenchymal imaging features in a criteria. And that needs to change in my opinion. That's why we have been uh, uh, working on the parenchymal features and publishing our results. And hopefully these data will uh, be integrated into a more comprehensive diagnostic criteria or severity criteria of chronic pancreatitis. Our first uh, pub uh, publication as an imaging biomarker was T1 signal intensity ratio. And uh, the, the currently the, the, the Quantitative MRI futures are also accepted for publication, and there are more papers will come out of the chronic pancreatitis, diabetes, and pancreatic cancer consortium in the near future. These are cross-sectional results, and within the next five uh, years or so, we will start publishing longitudinal follow-up results as well. So that's going to solidify the parenchymal imaging, importance of parenchymal imaging in chronic pancreatitis. Pancreatic elastography, I just see the question in the chat box. Mm -hmm. uh, I have, um, I tried to do pancreatic elastography in one of the, uh, the Minimap study. Uh, we could not have a good um, uh, fortunes in a in multi-institutional study. And there is still not uh, uh, enough uh, vendor support for MR elastography especially from uh, one vendor is really uh, into MR elastography, but others are not. So that's really limiting us at this time to do a clinical MR elastography in these patients. And second, as I have mentioned, uh, MR elastography resolution is very, very low. And if patient has uh, really atrophic pancreas, and sometimes pancreas is not even uh, easy to see, in MR elastograph images. So I'm, I have reservations for the future of MR elastograph, but I hope I will be proven wrong. Perfect. Before we wrap up, I'd like to have each of you give a quick take home message to our audience. We'll start with Dr. Chari for a second um, so that we can really have that one salient point. Yeah, I think the message that we are trying to 
send across is that, you know, consider new onset diabetes a high risk group for pancreatic cancer because the risk is around half to 1% in that group, no different from colon cancer or lung cancer risk in their respective populations. And one of the clues there is this paradoxical weight loss, though it has to be taken in the context of uh, treatment and other things. So, but it should be in the mind of people that if somebody develops diabetes, they should also consider the possibility that it's underlying cancer in the right setting. Sorry, Excellent. not one sentence, but. No, no, no. Always, we always will take an extra. Um, and Dr. Turkis, would you, uh, would you like to provide us your, your main take home point message for the audience? Uh, main take home point will be uh, basically about chronic pancreatitis and look out for the new uh, publications to come out. And uh, we need to, uh, I'm speaking on uh, radiologist's behalf, we need to come up with better diagnostic criteria and better uh, imaging tools for uh, you clinicians. And we are working on this and NIH is supporting us. Hopefully good things will come out within the next five years or so. Excellent. Well, we're always looking forward to what the future holds. And I think that you both have given us an insight into that future in terms of early detection of pancreatic cancer and better detecting acute and chronic pancreatitis changes and where things will go in the future. Thank you everyone for joining us. And thank you to the Caper Pancreas Academy for this amazing event and wonderful opportunity. Hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.